welcome uh, to today's exciting event. Uh, I'm delighted to uh, introduce our, our two main speakers, uh, as well as their team, briefly. Uh, Nora Abarakat is Assistant Professor of History here at Stanford and a historian of the late Ottoman Empire and the modern Middle East. Her research focuses on people, commodities, and landscapes and interior regions between the Mediterranean and the Indian Ocean in the 19th and 20th centuries. Apart from many chapters and articles, she is currently working on a book project, Bedouin Bureaucrats, Nomads and Property in the Ottoman Empire, which examines the ways in which tent dwellers of the Syrian interior both aided and opposed large-scale agricultural initiatives on the desert fringe. While teaching in the Gulf, between a Berkeley PhD and a current Stanford position, she co-founded Open Gulf, about which we'll hear today. The co-founder, also on this call, uh, was David Risley, a comparative medievalist and digital humanist, currently Associate Professor of Digital Humanities at NYU Abu Dhabi. His research straddles the domains of late medieval court culture, Mediterranean studies, multilingual corpora analysis, and the spatial humanities. His homepage lists a wealth of research projects in digital humanities, especially in site-specific research, deploying geospatial data to model human phenomena. Uh, and this uh, is um, uh, exactly what uh, spatial humanities uh, uh, are. He founded and organized the first digital humanities training institute in the Middle East uh, in Beirut in 2015. Joining them to introduce Open Gulf will be Camille Cole, Junior Research Fellow at Jesus College, Cambridge, Nada Amagui, Arts and Humanities Postgraduate Research Fellow at NYU Abu Dhabi and a recent graduate of that university's Arab Crossroads Studies Program, and Mo Khalil, a sophomore at Stanford, tentatively majoring in English and Computer Science at a SESTA intern working with Open Gulf. At this point, I'd like to hand over to William Parrish to take it from here. Hello, thank you, uh, Professor Parker. I just want to, I'll be handling the Q&A for this event, and I just wanted to remind everyone to be respectful uh, in their questions during the talk, both out of respect for the speaker and for the other participants. You can post your questions in the chat at the bottom. However, once the talk is over, we will give individuals the opportunity to ask the questions themselves, unmute themselves, and ask. And so, you can just raise your hand, uh, or if you want, if you posted a question in the chat and then you want to ask it yourself, uh, we'll give you that opportunity. And at this point, I want to pass it on to Nora. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'm just going to share my screen to get us started. I hope that is visible to everybody. Okay. So I want to thank, first, to start with a couple of thank yous. First, to Giovanna Cesarani for welcoming Open Golf into the SESTA community remotely this year, even though we haven't actually met in person yet. Um, I also want to thank Daniel Bush for all of his help with all things SESTA, especially getting Stanford students involved with Open Golf. Um, which has just been really expansive and generative for us in many ways. Um, I also want to thank Grant Parker um, for doing that introduction so I don't have to, and uh, William for moderating. So um, I'm just going to start off by introducing, I don't know what I did with the thing to advance the slides. One second, I will advance the slide. Oh, I am also supposed to say that if you want to look at the slides on your own browser, there is a um, link to them right here. Okay. So Open Gulf is a transdisciplinary multi-institutional research group focusing on creating digital infrastructures for a community of scholars working on historical projects related to the Arabian Peninsula, Iran, and Iraq broadly defined. Uh, we're going to start today, I'm going to start off with a brief introduction to the field of Gulf studies, which I imagine some of our um, attendees are not uh, familiar with. Then we're going to discuss how we think um, in this research group, group about creating scholarly infrastructures. And we'll also talk a bit about the genesis of our research group over the past three years. 
Um, we're then going to introduce you to three of the projects that Open Golf has team members are working on currently. Uh, the first is a handwritten text recognition project using 19th century letters from the British res res residency in Bushir, which is in contemporary Iran. We're also going to talk about our work annotating and mapping toponyms from multilingual texts and a project on spatializing Ottoman governance that was focused on a late Ottoman map of Iraq. Um, we'll offer, also offer some very brief conclusions. Okay, so I want to just talk briefly about, um, about Gulf Studies and also direct, direct you to our project website. It doesn't have much of the material that we're working on, but it does give you a sense of the structure of the project. That's opengulf.github.io. So Gulf Studies is a field that deals broadly with the land masses and waterways that you see on this map, the Arabian Peninsula, Iran, and Iraq. In terms of historical scholarship, this region sits kind of uncomfortably both in 20th century area studies frameworks and in more recent ocean-based frameworks that historians have been discussing. So it's between the Indian Ocean and Mediterranean worlds. It's also between the Middle East and South Asia. The scholarship on the Gulf has really been dominated by the histories of local ruling regimes um, and also the history of the British Empire. So existing digitization efforts really reflect this situation. The most extensive and well-founded um, and well-funded, excuse me, project is run by the Qatar Digital Library through a partnership with the British Library. And they're working to digitize and create metadata for all of the materials in the British Library um, that are related to the Gulf, which are quite voluminous. And this approach of kind of collecting material from external imperial archives has really defined much of the traditional state archiving effort in the Gulf as well. Overall, the archival landscape in this field is quite fragmented. And I just wanna emphasize, pause for a minute and emphasize the connections that we have here at Stanford between um, with this fragmented archival situation in the Gulf. So many of you are probably aware that the Hoover Institute holds part of the Iraqi Ba'ath regime's archive that the American military looted from Baghdad during the inv invasion in 2003. So this question of the politics of archives and empire and the creation of historical knowledge about the Gulf region is actually quite entangled with our experiences here at Stanford and at SESTA. But for us, this fragmented archival situation, it was actually part of the inspiration for David and I when we first founded Open Gulf um, at NYU Abu Dhabi in 2018. The limitations of state archives are a challenge, but we also see them as an opportunity. There are many private archives, for example, that are looking for ways to make their material more known to researchers researchers without surrendering them to a particular state archive. So what we're trying to do is create new scholarly infrastructures that are not defined by the British or the American or other imperial or national projects. We're trying to engage with those forms, but also work across them, work over them, and work under them. So we're really trying to work with what's available and recenter regional voices um, in, our, in, our, in thinking about scholarly infrastructures for the Gulf. So at this point, I'm going to pass it on to um, David Risley to talk more about how we think about this idea of scholarly infrastructures. Great. Thank you, Nora. And thanks to everyone at SESTA and Stanford for making this possible. It's great to see so many people whom I know and who I don't know yet on this call. So what we're calling research infrastructures or scholarly infrastructures, what I've just listed as SIs on the slide, are increasingly found in 21st century scholarship. And perhaps that's something that's a, a truism for uh, people who come to a talk at SESTA. But I think it, it, it is, is worth restating. So for some divisions of knowledge, um, scholars have become so used to these infrastructures that they're invisible. They're just taken for granted. In the case of print scholarship, um, we might call a scholarly infrastructure things like key encyclopedias or databases, uh, sorry, not databases, uh, listings, um, catalogs, atlases, reference works, biobibliographical dictionaries, even modes of scholarly communication such as journals or even the academic conference, the in-person academic conference. In the digital realm, um, in which we've been working as humanities scholars since, at least partially since the 1990s, we see a whole gamut of other kinds of resources, uh, including but not limited to subject or journal databases, digital textual or map collections. 
So historians in the digital age are not only consumers of information, um, but in DH labs like SESTA or in um, research groups like Open Gulf around the world, we've begun to create digital knowledge and collaboration with others um, amongst uh, faculty, um, with students, like those who are represented on the call, including, uh, but also including librarians, research engineers, and a whole um, um, spectrum of other people who uh, contribute um, their know-how and their knowledge to the creation of those resources. So those resources are created in formats or are put into formats uh, intentionally uh, designed to be reused by others. So we have um, uh, structured databases, we have corpora, we have data for GIS systems, geographic information systems, gazetteers, etc. Now, when it comes to non-Western parts of the world, um, and I will use the example of Middle Eastern studies, or, and particularly Middle Eastern studies uh, done in the Middle East, but not exclusively, and then especially a field like Gulf studies, digital historical resources, um, and I hear, would say both the commercial ones that have been created for us and the scholarly digital resources that we ourselves are creating are markedly less common. So, and when they do exist, um, one of the uh, points that Nora just made, I think is very relevant. They're often dependent upon sources coming from colonial archives. And so in, in the case of Gulf studies, that really means that the overwhelming majority of what people are using are coming from British colonial archives. So I'd like to stress that by using this term of scholarly infrastructure, we're suggesting not only hardware, right? Things for sharing information, uh, platforms enabling communication, such as the one we're using now, Zoom, um, for the delivery of information, but in particular, the creation of scholarly building blocks, um, workflows, workspaces, um, the kinds of things that make up a web presence um, and that embody our critical commitments and our values and that, uh, that we hold dear as scholars. And so here I'm drawing a little bit on a recent article by Jill Gildy about scholarly infrastructures as critical uh, interventions. Um, so, with the virtualization of academic research in recent years, um, it's allowed all kinds of interesting things to happen, like international teams like our own to be built, even the adoption of platform as service models. Um, and then especially in 2020, um, working largely remotely, not in person. Now this has had a, the positive effect of allowing us to include more voices in our project teams, uh, to benefit from the cross-pollination of different um, points of view, so different disciplinary points of view, different source materials and different language sets. But one of the main commitments of the project directors, co-directors of Open Golf, so myself and Nora, um, has been to focus on expanding workflows to incorporate wider perspectives while ensuring that the scholarly infrastructures are still available openly um, to um, not just the members of our various, uh, the various members of our research group, but to the larger scholarly community. Now, this has not been without its share of challenges, and I think we are going to hear a little bit more about today, especially where multilingual work is concerned. So the thing that I'd like to just finally say about scholarly infrastructures is if they are starting points or building blocks for scholarly argument, they also shape and direct future argument. And so the embedded values that are inside of them um, create scholarship uh, as we move forward. So it's worth asking ourselves the question that Joe Gouldy does in the beginning of her essay, um, which is what values does infrastructure building represent? So can I have the next slide, please? So I'd like to give you just a little bit of an idea about how Open Gulf has developed as a research group um, over uh, the last three years. So on the slide is a timeline that you're gonna see repeated across the, um, as a kind of mnemonic, across the, the presentation today, helping situate yourself, uh, situate uh, the, our, read, our listeners um, with respect to the various phases. So if we look at this, for example, uh, in 2018, uh, really Open Golf was only an idea. I don't think it even had a name at that point, but it was a series of, of classroom embedded experiments uh, in essentially digital pedagogy, thinking about source historical source material and digital mapping that um, Nora and I put together um, way back when. As we move forward, I would say that the next phase I like to call our platform adoption phase, where we realized we actually needed some spaces, some online spaces to organize. And that what I mean by that is organize more uh, than just putting things in Google Drive or putting things in ArcGIS Online. 
after that, I think that we became increasingly interested in connecting to and drawing on resources in other libraries, since this is particularly where we turn to the Qatar Digital Library and many of their IIIF compliant um, uh, archive materials. I call this the transcription turn of Open Gulf. After that, um, we uh, began, and this is actually early 2020, and this is somewhat uncannily just before um, uh, Corona came around. And this is where we began to, I think, develop new kinds of workflows, but in particular virtualize the research, right? So this is where we were turning to transcription um, platforms like from the page, we're working with Transcribus, and we were also uh, adopting team messaging systems that allowed us as we became scattered in the world um, under the pandemic to keep going. Um, I would say that really the most significant step after that, which we're going to hear about in the presentation, is what I would call our empire and language expansion phase, where we uh, not only worked with the British sources, but we then pushed forward into other languages and other regional uh, languages of historical import. So um, if I can have the next slide, please, I'm going to be talking about uh, the first project uh, and the first project, one of the projects rather, one of the projects that corresponds really to what I was calling the transcription turn. So what we're dealing with is a set of materials that are in the India office records uh, in London that have been uh, digitized recently by the QDL. And we've been using the AI um, powered uh, handwritten text recognition platform Transcribus um, developed in Austria to take those handwritten documents and turn them into digital searchable and therefore computable text. Um, this project dates to this, again, to this part that I'm calling the, trans, uh, the transcription term. Next slide, please. So this IOR, India Office Records file, R15-1, contains many ledgers, um, incoming and outgoing correspondence of the Bushir Residency. Um, Bushir Residency was the colonial, British colonial presence in the region located now in Bushir on the Iranian coast of the Gulf. And uh, that presence is marked from the late 18th century to about the mid 20th century. In reality, our document base takes us essentially from um, the 1820s or so uh, through to the end of the 19th century, after which point they were typewritten documents. And so those are already um, optically character recognized in the Qatar Digital Library. So these uh, 26,000 pages or so, or about 180 volumes, um, were written in a variety of hands. They've been used in some scholarly monographs, James Olney's monograph, for example, um, uh, by Gulf Studies scholars, but they have not really been fully exploited um, for what they can tell us about the circulation of goods in the Arabian or Persian Gulf, the role that the British saw for themselves in maintaining a maritime peace, um, debates about the abolition of slavery uh, in the Indian Ocean, as well as in general, the role of the Gulf region in the functioning of empire. So what we've used is we've used this HCR platform that I mentioned, Transcribus, to begin to construct hand-specific and cross-hand models capable of transcribing these letter collections. Now, any machine learning approach requires the creation of training data, obviously, uh, which in our case meant lots of manual transcription of samples of different hands um, in, um, across the corpus. Um, lots of transcription, lots of subsequent correction, and then retraining of the models. But we've achieved actually quite um, acceptable error rates and uh, success in applying models across collections. Um, we'll be working on this summer and this fall to see how just how well we might scale this project up to the 180 plus volumes. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so. One of the things that's obviously when you have a large corpus, one of the things that's interesting and in particular with a scattered archive um, is that we're thinking that distant reading will be an interesting way of accessing um, what Bailey has called the empire information nexus. So, or uh, getting at the knowledge generated in the service of empire to use the expression of um, maybe the Foucault. Of course, one of the advantages of automatic transcription is that with an initial investment of time, text creation can be then scaled up, um, not without error, but it can definitely be scaled and a lot of material can be produced. Now this leads itself to um, <clears throat> interesting uh, analyses like topic modeling or what we see on the right hand upper right hand corner of the slides some crude keyword analysis that was just carried out in Voyant, in which we've been successful in distinguishing different registers in the aggregate of those letters, in particular letter, uh, letters in book 46 of eight, uh, or 1826 volume. These are of uh, outgoing letters. 
Um, and so what you can see here is a real distinction between the kinds of political or diplomatic language, honorific address, religious language, even governmental uh, terminology. That's these kind of multi-layered um, registers in the text. Now, this shows promise, however, I think for distant textual approaches, such as topic modeling, as I mentioned, or for thinking about you know, the multi-layered political discourse that we might find at the residency, we've been also collecting multi uh, metadata from the letters in order to build uh, correspondence networks. Now, correspondence networks are not unknown to this particular group um, at SESTA. And we had, so what, what you see here is a really, really basic one um, uh, visualized in another tool, which is not unknown to SESTA um, in, in Palladio. And of course, this is a very simplistic and not very useful network because this is an outgoing letter collection. So basically the author of most of the letters in this collection is the same person. So that's not gonna create a particularly complex correspondence network, but across volumes and in between volumes, I think that we might end up with some more interesting materials. Now, I like to think of this particular approach of distant reading these letter collections as a kind of Persian Gulf colonial mapping Republic of Letters project um, with the, however, the adjacent texts or correspondence of corpora for a kind of blending into that, um, blending into the network analysis of some textual analysis. Next slide, please. Now, less, distance in, less distant in its approach, but more focused on editing and digital publication of selected letters in the Bushir collection is a workflow that I'm working on at present. It uses the neural structural training of transcribus to mark up the letters, um, the structure of the letters automatically, which can then be uh, embedded into the, into the XML exports. And those outputs or those XML uh, exports from transcribus um, with a little bit of XSLT can turn into essentially what are TEI letters. And so what I'm hoping to do is to take a certain portion of this and to have, if you like, a kind of digitally edited um, version of these letters which are not known. And the question of course remains in my mind, which letters would we like to do? Um, a certain amount of human intervention and technical know-how is gonna to have to go into this project, but there are so many topics that are here that I think really what we are dealing with is more like an embarrassment of riches, right? Than of which ones do we actually choose? So we have piracy and maritime trade and slavery and all that goes. But I think what that would produce with something like um, TI publisher or some kind of publishing toolkit for the web would be a great global resource for teaching um, global history and Gulf studies. So uh, next slide, please. I'm going to end my section here just with what are the emergent questions that have come out of this research questions that have come out of this project so far. I think that really we were interested in in the correspondence of the 19th century Gulf. What were they talking about? Who was writing? Um, who were they writing to? What were the circuits of communication? Um, that underpin this uh, information empire nexus that I was talking about before. What kinds of high level textual research would these searchable text versions actually enable? And what kind would be most appropriate for the kind of materials inside? I don't really have an answer to that question, but it's a question that I'm asking myself a lot these days. And then finally, I think that if we, picking up on the idea of workflows expanding to meet other languages, how can we use these methods uh, to work with multi-hand historical texts in order to do the same for other collections if such collections um, can be digitized. Thank you and I'm going to pass on now to Nora. Thank, <clears throat> thank you David. Um, Mo and I are going to talk briefly about the workflow that we've developed for annotating and mapping toponyms that are extracted from historical texts about the Gulf region and how we moved from working on this canonical British geographical text in English um, in the early stages of the Open Gulf Project to multilingual texts from multiple imperial entities. Um, so David's talked at length about the first stages of the project. We were thinking about ways to make these widely used um, British sources digitally available and also to kind of deconstruct them as imperial knowledge production. Um, and beyond the Bushier residency papers, we also developed a workflow for visualizing the way that British imperial texts constructed the Gulf geographically. Um, and Mo will get into the workflow in detail, 
But when we first started, we were working with this widely used historical source. It's John G. Lorimer's Gazetteer of the Persian Gulf, Oman, and Central Arabia. It a snippet from it appears on the top left of the screen. And one of the reasons that we started this process with an English text was accessibility. So the Gazetteer was already digitized. We could easily create text files for collaborative annotation and other kinds of computational analysis. And we were also teaching at an English medium university. So starting with English enabled many student assistants to get involved in this project. Um, at, at, at that point, we were at NYU Abu Dhabi. So over two years, we identified over 20,000 locations mentioned in that text. And there's a preliminary map of that data um, on the bottom left of the screen. We quickly realized that we wanted to see Gulf geographies through other lenses beyond the British. Um, so we started working on a French text on the geography of Nej from the early 19th century. And then we started working on an Ottoman Turkish text from the mid 19th century um, that focuses on the geography of the Iran-Iraq border. And now uh, Mo is working on two different Arabic texts. One is an administrative manual written by a local official for an Ottoman governor of the province of Basra in southern Iraq. It's focused on a very ge granular geography of that space. Um, that text was also digitized, so it's easily accessible to us. The other is a wide ranging history uh, written by a well known religious scholar in Iraq in the late 1860s. Um, he really integrated the history of Iraq into this wider space of the Arabian Peninsula. And that text is available in a PDF of a print version from the 1990s. Um, Mo is going to talk more about sort of the technical stuff that we've run into in our multilingual turn, but I want to talk um, a little bit about sort of promise we see and then some of the pedagogical and collaborative challenges that that entailed. So moving the project to a multilingual scope has shown us what we could create with this particular open golf project um, more broadly, an interactive gazetteer of the region that links information that different texts have produced about particular place names over time. Um, it also introduces many questions about comparative empire, imperial versus local or other kinds of productions of space. Um, and the last part of our presentation is gonna get into that. Um, there have also been many challenges. Some, I said, Mo will we'll discuss the technical challenges. Um, but when we started, one reason we chose an English text is because we were teaching at an English medium uni university. So it was easy to find student assistants who could engage with this text. When we started working with Ottoman Turkish, I quickly realized that it was going to be very challenging to get undergraduates involved or really to get anyone outside of a small circle of specialized knowledge involved. And working in Arabic has in a way been easier because it both centers voices outside the British imperial sphere and also allows us to engage and work with more students like Mo. And I'm gonna pass it on to, to Mo now to talk more about our workflow. Awesome, thank you, Nora. Um, so as Nora mentioned earlier, the reason that we were able to start with the Lorimer text is mainly because it was accessible. Um, the text was already digitized so we could just use it straight away. Now, unfortunately, with a lot of Arabic texts, that level of accessibility and digitization just doesn't exist. And so we had to figure out a way to reach that point. And so what we decided to use was Transcribus. Now, David already mentioned that Transcribus was originally made for handwritten text recognition, but we thought it might work with right to left print text. And surprisingly, it did. But another issue that we faced was that unlike with English or transliterated Turkish, there was no already available model. And so our initial goal was to create a viable transcription model that we could use with Arabic texts. And so we started out with a set of 18th century newspapers as our ground truth, which was a very limited set of data. And from that, our workflow was mainly, we would load the document into the software, use the data we already had available as ground truth, and then run the model on around five pages, correct the test set, and then rerun the model over and over again. And after around four or five times of running the model, we reached a test um, error rate of around 2%, which is extremely well, considering the software wasn't made for that. And at that point, we were able to run it on the whole text. And so we had a fully digitized text. And so we loaded, it, loaded that text into Recogito. And what Recogito is, is it's an annotation software that's made for finding place names and toponyms. And the way it works is it's connected to this a bunch of databases that have several place names, coordinates, and all you had to do is annotate the place name and it would automatically recognize all other instances of that place name in the text and connect them to the database. And finally, we had to do our ultimate goal, which was geovisualization. And we used GIS software 
Um, Refugito has its has its own built in GIS software, which we were able to use and allowed us to create really nice visuals like the one you see at the bottom right. Um, next slide, please. So the main issue we had with Transcribus, which I already mentioned, was that there just wasn't much data that we could use. And generally what happens when data is limited is there's a lot of overfitting to that data set. And so I already said that um, the data set we were using was a set of 18th century newspapers. And what we found pretty quickly was that in these 18th century newspapers, punctuation was very, very rare. And when it did exist, it was mostly only periods and the occasional question mark. And so what happens is a lot of mistaken punctuation. And so you can see on the top right, um, even if you don't know Arabic, um, the picture on the left of the arrow, that symbol at the far left kind of looks like a reversed comma. And that is what it is. It's a comma in Arabic. And for the most part, when transcribers would see something like that, it would recognize it as a close parenthesis. And it took several um, rounds of just retraining the model for it to figure it out. And so that was just one of the issues, but there were many other overfitting issues when it came to punctuation, when it came to um, just dots in general. And it took a lot of time for that, for transcribers to all figure that out and just iron out all the issues. Um, now with Rectogito, which was the annotation software we used, um, the, the, challenges we, the challenges we faced mainly were more design choices than they were flaws in the software. And it was because Rectogito was made for Latin text generally. Um, the first example of this is with prefix and suffix recognition. Um, now you might know in English, prefixes and suffixes aren't very common, especially when it comes to proper nouns. And so the way that Rectogito was made was that when it would recognize, when it would auto, auto annotate other instances of the same word, it would make sure that that word was surrounded by two white spaces or a white space in a period. And in Arabic, that ju just doesn't work because in Arabic, um, prefixes and suffixes are very common when it comes to um, proper nouns. And the Arabic word for in, for example, is just a prefix. And so often what would happen is we'd find a place name, annotate it, and then Rekvita would not recognize any other instance of the name because it was surrounded by prefixes and suffixes. But the fact that you can just do a command F or control F and look for that place name proves that this is possible. Um, and it's just a software design choice that we had to deal with. Another example of this was um, the, the limited non-Latin spelling data that was in the database um, that we were using. So you can see here for the place name like Busta, for example, there were around 10 or 15 different Latin spellings of that same place name. But when it came to Arabic, there was only one spelling. And so any small difference in spelling um, meant that the, the, the Rekvita would not recognize the place name. And so we would have to manually go in, find the place name in a database or in Google Maps and input the coordinates into um, the software. And so I think that's on one hand that these are, those are challenges that we had to face, but it also is pretty promising because it shows that the issue isn't with the software, but the software that we already have and that we're already using is capable of doing what we want for the future. And the only issue we're facing is the lack of available data and the lack of prior work done. And so this proves that with the right data sets and with the right software design choices, speeding up the workflow is definitely possible. And so the main issue with right to left language processing that we found was not in the lack of available software, but it was in the lack of available data and prior work done. And I'll hand it back to Nora right now so she can talk a bit more about that. Thank you, Mo. So one of our main questions is about how to streamline our workflow in a way that allows us to add more text uh, and in a way that remains accessible to collaborators, um, which is really the philosophy of the project that David started, started us out with. So as Mo said, our question about a custom instance of Recogito might be one very straightforward way of doing that. Uh, the map that you see here is a really simple example of our preliminary work on this project. It shows just a snippet of the data we've created from two Ottoman texts on southern Iraq from the mid 19th century. And as we complete these data sets, we start to get a, a, a sense of the of just different imperial geographical imaginaries. So the red dots on the map are from that report of commission on the Iran-Iraq border that I mentioned. The blue is a, this detailed report on tax farms around the city of Basra. And both show this intense concentration of Ottoman knowledge production about place around rivers in Iraq. Um, but this work has also brought up big questions for us about how to balance and compare texts that represent different densities and scales of representation. 
And we're also constantly thinking about what to prioritize. So when we think about the historical construction of the Iran-Iraq border, for example, which imperial texts from the Qajar imperial universe would be, would be useful? What's the best way to go about doing this kind of inter-imperial comparison across multiple scales and across multiple textual genres? Um, I'm now going to pass it on to Camille Cole to talk about our work on spatializing Ottoman governance in particular. Okay, thanks, Nora. Um, so Netta and I are now going to introduce the third and the, I guess most recent part of the research project, which is where we've sort of expanded into more different kinds of, of sources. And specifically what we're going to focus on um, is looking at the geographies of Ottoman governance in Iraq and Arabia. Next slide, please. So this part of the project started with the map that you see on the left, which was produced by the Ottoman Sixth Army in 1909-1910 and depicts the winter territories of tribes living in the three provinces of Mosul, Baghdad, and Basra, which is the territory that essentially now makes up Iraq. The small inset map at the bottom depicts part of what is now Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Qatar, and Bahrain, some of which was administratively part of Basra province at the time that the map was made. And the map was also accompanied um, in the archives by a table listing information about the population, housing, and military strength of the tribes whose territories are depicted on the map. So the map was interesting to us at first for what it can tell us about Ottoman sovereignty in Iraq and Arabia, and for what it suggests about how Ottoman ideas about the nature and proper administration of tribes was changing. So one of the overarching narratives of the Ottoman 19th century is that of territorial loss, especially in the Balkans and Egypt. In the Gulf, there wasn't as much loss, but the Ottoman authorities were squeezed by the steady British advancement up the coastline. And so we can think about this map as part of the combined attempt to resist European territorial encroachment on the one hand, and to collect taxes from shrinking Ottoman territory on the other, both of which required a new kind of knowledge production about people and land. And so the map visualizes the extent of this knowledge production project of Ottoman sovereignty. Um, if you look at the geo-referenced version of the map, which is on the right in the, the sort of red outlines, um, the, the red outlines are the, are the territories of the tribes um, from, the, from the first map. Um, and so you can see that the area depicted on the Arabian Peninsula is substantially larger than the area in Iraq, but it's much less detailed. And on the original rap, map, Arabia is relegated to the small inset at the bottom. This isn't that surprising. Iraq is where Ottoman attention was focused, where they had the most detailed information, and where sovereignty was most secure. But the map of the Arabian Peninsula also looks very different than standard maps of Ottoman sovereignty in Arabia, like the one you see in the middle, um, which locate the Ottomans only on the west coast of the peninsula. So the area covered by the tribal territory polygons, which is the area depicted on the archival map, mostly covers the empty parts of the standard map. This suggests that the Ottomans were thinking about sovereignty and territoriality in Arabia quite expansively, and we might even think about this knowledge production project as part of an Ottoman informal empire. The other thing the map visualizes very clearly is how Ottoman state building depended on the production of the tribe as a modular, standardized, and territorialized entity. The map and the accompanying table refer to a single unified category of tribe, or ashiret, in Ottoman Turkish. But this is a relatively new category at this time. The consolidation of many different kinds and sizes of groups under this single label was part of the process of making the tribe a unit of administration, which in turn was used to incorporate people, land, and the revenues they generated into the imperial system. But what's even more striking about the map is the fact that it is a map. Most Ottoman knowledge production about tribes was not spatial. There are plenty of lists in the archives that resemble this table, which show tribal population and military strength. But this is the only source that we've found for any part of the empire that spatializes that information. So the map represented a new way for the Ottomans of thinking about the nature of tribes, and in particular about the administrative unit of the tribe as an effective way to understand and manage people and land together. So now I'll hand it over to Netta to talk about how we went from the Ottoman archival map and table to something we could work with in a GIS platform. Thank you, Camille. Um, so just to echo the procedural workflows that my colleagues have just shared, I'd like to discuss the process of visualizing the maps and data that Camille just introduced from digitization and geo-referencing to polygon creation and data joining. 
So as you can see here on the map on the left, which is the one that Camille just introduced, we were met with these images or um, digital versions of the paper map um, that had to be manipulated in various ways so to allow us to get to our desired result, which was a digital version of the map that was ready for analysis. So the first thing we had to do was choose a software that would enable us to have the greatest range of features and tools while also fitting in with our cross-institutional team model as David and Nora um, talked about. So luckily, unlike with other softwares, matters of language compatibility, particularly with Arabic script, were not really of concern or uh, a matter in our decision um, in choosing either of the tools that we considered. So as far as GIS tools go, while ArcGIS would have been a much simpler tool to use and certainly more user-friendly and visually appealing than other GIS tools, and if you've used ArcGIS, you might um, resonate with that sentiment, we opted instead for QGIS because it allowed us to share files and work and view projects as a team without really having to worry about the institutional access across our many home campuses um, to the various functionalities in ArcGIS. Things such as um, the server space and the different tools that we would be able to access with institutional accounts or regular free accounts. So the element of openness was really our biggest priority when choosing a software and ultimately the reason that we settled for QGIS. So our next step was to geo-reference the map and to begin creating polygons that would bring these tribal territories to life. So this step is what helps us to transform the image into a digital object that can be manipulated and analyzed to which we could attribute different pieces of data. So we manually traced each of the tribal territories along their borders, and it might be a bit hard to see on the slide here, um, but if you take this uh, right side image and you look at those red lines, those are the outlines of the tribal territories and that's what we had to um, trace to create the polygons. So once we did that, we had a really rich mosaic of over 200 polygons. Um, and then later on in the process, these were the elements to which we could join uh, data that came from the attached table and how we were ultimately able to visualize things such as population, housing, and militarization, which is what Camille just um, discussed. So while the process of digitizing the map itself is relatively simple and straightforward, um, because it involves so many steps and a lot of human or manual intervention, there is a lot of room for error with georeferencing being the very, sorry, the very first. So one challenge that we faced here, for example, is that the map was drawn either not entirely to scale or using a projection that we couldn't figure out or that we weren't using. Um, and so it set the digitization process almost a step behind because we, you know, we started with this inconsistency of the map and the contemporary map of Iraq. And so this then, of course, affects the location of the polygons that we later traced based on the paper map, um, and then the attribution of each piece of data to the polygons, and then how it aligns with the contemporary location of certain places. Um, so then that would be more um, evident once we detach the polygons from the paper map. So as Mo discussed with regards to the HTR process on Transcribus, there's a lot that we have to do in each step to minimize the errors and verify the accuracy of what these softwares are enabling us to do. And so one way that we tried to mitigate this uh, georeferencing issue was to not only use city names as reference coordinates, but also other topographical markers like waterways, rivers, uh, lakes, um, these kind of features that might be more um, stable in, you know, more consistent across the paper and the contemporary map. Again, this might lead to other inaccuracies if a certain river has shifted or a lake has shrunk, but ultimately there's only so much that we could do to avoid all of these errors. So what we've tried to do is remain transparent with the process and um, kind of jotting down all of the steps to retrace the process if need be. Um, if we could please move to the next slide. Thank you. So after creating these polygons for both Iraq and Najd, so both parts of the map, um, we could basically dissociate these polygons from the map and then overlay it directly onto the contemporary base map of the region um, so that we could then visualize the data that was attached to the map, which you can see um, the data is in this table in the middle on both the paper version and then the digital version. So after a very tedious transcription process by both Camille and Nora, we imported our spreadsheet from Google Sheets, which again, a tool that we chose because of its synchronous co-working possibilities, its openness, its freeness to everyone at every institution. We imported the data set into QGIS and then later ArcGIS when we wanted to experiment with different visualizations. 
um, and then join the data set to each of the polygons. So to join these two components, the polygons and the data, there needed to be a link between the table and the map. So we came up with a really simple, unique ID system that connected the spatial polygons to each row of data. So then um, each polygon, let's say polygon number four, would be attached to row number four and all the corresponding information in the table. Um, here again, there was uh, the issue of the manual involvement, as I mentioned, uh, in such a tedious process as transcription, where a minor typo or a seemingly minor typo might really um, impact the resulting analysis and visualization. So a missing zero at the end of population count, misspelled tribal name, a wrong unique ID could create an entirely different map. And this happened several times when we realized the calculations were way off and the numbers weren't making sense. But ultimately, as you can imagine, when you add a table really filled to the brim with information about each tribe and territory, a really rich image emerges, which allows us to get a visual sense of those tribes and their relation to one another. In a matter of just a few seconds in QGIS, um, we can choose to highlight and analyze particular elements and patterns in the data set, such as population distribution by gender, weapons per tribe, surface area, etc. cetera. Um, this map here on the right, for example, shows um, the density of male population per tribe by using a core pleth visualization, where the darker polygons have a higher male population ratio, and then those in yellow have no data attributed to this category. Um, so I'll just pass the mic back to Camille to share more about other maps that we created using QGIS and our data. Thanks, Nada. Okay, so, so let me just give you an example of one of the visualizations that we've created showing different aspects of the knowledge that Ottoman authorities were producing about Iraqi tribes. So the map that you see on the slide depicts housing. For each tribe, the table records how many tents the tribe had and how many sarifas they had. A sarifa is a house built of reeds, and you can see an image of, of some sarifas um, on the right. And they're often associated with the marshlands of southern Iraq. You can, you can see that the map has essentially four categories, all tents in light pink, all serifas in dark red, a mix of tents and serifas in the intermediate shades, and no data in gray. So the first thing that to say is that it was really important to us to visualize the null result, the tribes for which the authorities did not record information about housing. The map, just by virtue of being a map, can seem very authoritative and certain, and in some ways we've compounded that sense of certainty by extracting the polygons and putting them on the contemporary maps. Um, but in fact, it encompasses a great deal of, of uncertainty. And you can see in this case how that imperial uncertainty was concentrated in the borderlands of Iran. But as for the rest, given that serifas are built from reeds and given their association with the marshlands, I expected that we would see serifas concentrated in the south. And we do. But the second concentration of serifas in the north raises some interesting questions. Why are there so many serifas there? Was there some kind of trade in reeds um, with the marshlands? Or were the officials grouping multiple kinds of housing under the single category serifa? And if so, what does this tell us about how Ottoman officials understood housing, how they understood housing to relate to different ways of life? Uh, next slide, please. So at the same time, the map raises questions about the other populations living in this territory and the other kinds of dwellings they inhabited, the map makes it look like Iraq was neatly divided into the territories of tribes and only tribes. But in fact, as you might guess, there were plenty of people living in cities and towns, some of whom identified with tribes and some who did not. Um, there were certainly some serifas in the cities and towns, especially in the south, but further north, houses were mostly built of stone, mud, and brick. So were authorities accounting for these populations and these, these ways of life? If so, how? And how did they think about how this tribal geography overlapped or overlaid urban and other existing administrative geographies? The map and the table also raised parallel research questions about weapons, population, gender, and sect. And the map that you see on this slide is one of the other maps we've generated, um, which shows the density of weapons distribution with the darker color being a greater, greater number of weapons per person. More generally, thinking about the map alongside the work we're doing on the sources that Nora and Mo introduced brings us back to the question of how to understand and use these sources together. You know, if we consider the data sets together, what can they tell us, for example, about the different geographies of empire and modalities of power? What other kinds of sources should we add? And on that note, I'll hand it back to David to talk about how we're thinking about combining these data sets to create the building blocks that will allow us to ask new kinds of questions. 
Thanks, Camille. Can I have the next? Oh, perfect. Uh, on this slide, so one of the most exciting parts of the Open Golf Project, which we've heard, I think, uh, mentioned in multiple uh, parts of the presentation, is how this work is creating new ways to think about um, what, um, how we can think about this region um, that is of the general Arabian Peninsula and its surrounding um, limitrophic areas as a multi or inter imperial space. Um, we believe that the digital objects created by the Open Golf Project, um, transcriptions, uh, digital text, uh, spatial data sets, raster data, as we see here, are not only transdisciplinary in their creation, but they are also transdisciplinary in their possible generative quality, right? So we're not only bringing together a series of minds to create um, these kinds of digital objects, but they themselves will go on to create new um, knowledge. I believe that what we've created thus far in the, in the research group points to a more general trend in interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary research in the contemporary university, where the interoperability of data serves as the glue, if you like, or the mortar between different researchers and research projects. By following standard formats, by linking that data, new forms of knowledge production and recombination become possible, in other words. So the map that we recently we circulated with the announcement of this talk, which is on the slide right now, is a kind of a speculative assemblage. It's kind of a, a strange queer assemblage, actually, if you like, of different la layers of data that we wouldn't necessarily have put together um, if we uh, before, or certainly anyone else uh, in Gulf studies that we know of is putting together. What this map actually shows, it shows you point level data from Lorimer's Gazetteer, this 19th century British text that Nora mentioned earlier, overlaid onto the tribal territory polygons extracted from the Ottoman map. The pop-up box shows some information about one of those tribal, poly poly tribal polygons. But these two sources were produced at about the same time. They cover the same geographic spaces. Of course, they're written in different languages. They have different data densities, and they have differences in scope, genre, and even purpose, as we've heard. To top all this off, we've chosen proprietary base map from Esri of soil qualities. And that, so the, in a way, the reason for choosing the soil qualities, it has actually nothing to do with um, any of the current interests of the people in the project. But what it does is it posits that in the base map layer, the kind of role of the hypothetical next contributor to the Open Golf Project, who might just want to put a question like soil together with sovereignty with um, uh, geographic information um, of imperial uh, and uh, geographic information of imperial um, forces. Next, final slide, please. So from a few digital projects uh, to a transdisciplinary research group, that's the story that we hope we hopefully have told about Open Golf today. And I think that what we have really been confronted by here are a set of overlapping concerns. And I'd like just to read what I have here on the slide. First of all, concern over developing infrastructure. And that means both technical um, and human infrastructure. Training of core researchers and students in, and, 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 and um, uh, assuring continuity of that with the cycles of academic life. People leave, students graduate, or people come and go on the project. And the project, I think a research group has to um, account for that. We are always wanting to explore new source material and sometimes even digitizing that source material that isn't currently digitized. And that's often found in unconventional surroundings. Um, managing a, a large number of details related to a project. Nora and I have realized that we are now somehow advanced project managers after having worked on this for um, some time now. Exploring possibilities for funding, of course, but also insertion into the community of people related and interested in Gulf studies around the world, but also in the Gulf. Um, accommodating a diversity of interests, which only helps, um, I, in my opinion, um, the transdisciplinary potential, generative potential of, a, project, of a, a group like this. And finally, committing ourselves to some core values, um, namely openness, the centering of new voices in this field, which has always been, um, as Nora mentioned, kind of an offshore project, um, but also taking a critical comparative stance to colonial legacies. And, and finally, um, but, not, uh, let, but not at all least important, is the thinking about a research group as a site for training of new researchers um, in and outside of Gulf studies and making sure that those researchers are fairly compensated for their work. So with that, um, I believe that I will uh, stop. And I know that any of the people who have been here and speaking today would be very happy to have your questions or comments. Thank you very much.
Thank you, uh, uh, all of the presenters. Uh, first, I think we should all kind of give a round of applause to uh, to the talk and to the success. Um, that was very, I guess, just very riveting, especially as someone that works in um, with spatial data, spatiality. I actually work in uh, Native American Indigenous Studies, so uh, the question of how to spatialize tribal lands, tribal sovereignty is a big question uh, for me and, and my interest. So I want to open it up, uh, not to monopolize, so I want to open it up to any questions. If someone has a question, just raise your hand with the, uh, uh, the Zoom option and you can unmute yourself to ask uh, and we'll just go in kind of an orderly successive way. Uh, Merva. Well, thank you very much, Paul, for this for this amazing presentation and like this overview of your work. I was wondering, and this is sort of coming out of personal interest, like how do you manage this collaboration this efficiently? I know that like Nora and Noah are located here at Stanford. David is in Abu Dhabi, and I forgot the other two members where you guys are located. But how does it all work so smoothly? Like, David, do you want to say something about that? Okay, um, it is a work in progress, I guess I would say um, it definitely got a little bit more complicated when the co directors became located at different institutions that are um, a, you know, 11 to 12 hour time difference apart. Um, we've gotten, I guess there's a couple of things because our, you know, David's sort of genesis of the research group slide we didn't really talk about the project management element but it has been really huge for both of us. Um, one thing is that we use a messaging slack like uh, entity thing called Mattermost that David could talk a little bit more about, um, but it's it's slack like uh, that's helped immensely, especially with time zone differences, because, you know, we kind of can um, keep the different we have different channels for each of the different sub projects. Um, and we can also do direct messaging with that. And we can sort of, you know, when I'm awake in California and working on the project, um, I can be putting an input and then see what David and others said when I was sleeping. Um, inspired by SESTA, we've also just started this um, this year using Notion for project management. Um, we haven't quite put everything into that, but one of our, I mean, it, the, the for materials and for, you know, thinking and, and different kinds of data, we've mostly been um, just used in Google Drive because we started at NYU, which is completely integrated with the Google suite. That we've kind of grown out of that. It's become harder to manage everything um, in the Google Drive. And so we've been using, um, starting to think about using Notion for keeping ourselves organized, also for task management. Um, I would say, yeah, the institutional, the cross institutional part is a little bit complex, especially with student collaborators, because they're all working on different schedules. Stanford is on a quarter system, NYU Abu Dhabi is on a semester system. They also just have different structures of work and you know, when I first, the biggest challenge I had in the first quarter was understanding that I wasn't just gonna like hire students out of my research budget, which is what I did at NYU. And that this is through, um, you know, a completely different bureaucratic mechanism at Stanford. So um, it is it is complicated and challenging, but I also would just say, I think that's part of the promise of the project. And for me, it's also become part of the way that we're getting out of that nation state and imperial based mode of work right and mode of producing data and research because we really are on this global scale and um and not not necessarily you know we're, we're attached to institutions in, in very tangible ways but having the research group sort of float above them um is has been has been i think really positive david if you have anything to add that was kind of off the cuff but we've talked and thought a lot about this question Merve. it's really quite central I will add a little bit, and if any of the students want to talk about what it's like from their side um, to be on a project that has a structure to it, I think that might be an interesting um, um, intervention. But what I guess I would say, Merve, is that, I, that for me, one of the things that I had to learn, I guess, learn not only on this project, but on smaller projects, which 
are largely funded by um, my research funds, right? They're not funded um, um, by a by grants. Um, they're not. They don't have large amounts of funding. In fact, one of the things we've tried to do is to keep the infrastructure of the project actually quite modular and quite lightweight and sustainable in that respect. Now that that means that we've sort of migrated in all of the directions to where we could get things uh, for free, right? So we kind of ended up with a Mattermost instance for free, and we've ended up with uh, Ricogito, the, their hosted version, the Pelagius Commons hosted version of Ricogito. And I think we're rethinking some of those decisions right now. But for me, one of the most important things was was about scoping correctly, like scoping the work to what an undergraduate can actually do in a certain amount of time. I gave a paper at the uh, DHSI project management uh, conference last year, and which I called 10 hours by 10 weeks. And the idea was that, you know, you can hire someone for 15 hours a week, and you can hire for someone for a, as many hours in the semester. But realistically, what you get out of, out of a student it, that, who is interested uh, in the work that they're doing is a portion of what is possible and for a portion of the semester. So being realistic about that, and so sort of, you know, um, dividing the work up into manageable parts um, that people can um, can take on has been really important. The last thing that I would say is about keeping a project going is really about that point that I made at the end about not, not the one about fair compensation, which is extraordinarily important, but the one about training um, is that I think one of the one of the reasons that there was such interest and particularly during COVID um, in this project on the part of our student researchers and and, and people who joined the project just in general, like Camille, was that there was actually a lot to learn in doing this kind of work. So it's, it's not just the subject material, it's not just the um, learning more about golf studies, but there are these, I mean, I hate the term, but there are these transferable skills, if you like, these, all of these other things that one learns when one works in projects. Um, and to be honest, I feel like many of the people in the project have become better experts in some of these things than I was, even if I was the one who got the ball rolling. So making sure that there is an environment that is both, um, which people are taking away, they're not just giving time and data to a project in exchange for um, compensation, but they're also um, enriched by the experience of working in a group and they find their own skill sets um, um, uh, deepened and, and widened, right, if you like, over time. So I think those are the things that, for me, keep the, everything moving. I mean, that's the the grease of this whole system, this whole machine. Yeah. Maybe the student, if there's a student who wants to say something about, or uh, Camille, uh, uh, postgraduate, postdoctoral uh, 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 researcher on the project, we want to just talk about like what is it that, what 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 makes it work for you? Like, what's the, how does it move forward? I'll just add a few words. Um, I actually joined Open Golf last um, summer, right at the beginning of the pandemic, and so I'm not entirely sure how um, such a you know cross institutional um, model might have worked before the pandemic. But um, right over the summer, we started kind of working with different platforms like Zoom and meeting just once a week, trying to figure things out, and then keeping the rest of our work pretty asynchronous. Um, like Nora mentioned, using things like Mattermost to just check in and then just keep working on our own. And I think that was something that was really um, helpful for me as you know a fresh graduate, just having independence to um, work on my own, but also having mentors to check in with every once in a while, and then um, just feel like I'm trusted enough to do my own work and to create my own outputs while checking in every once in a while. Um, and I only graduated as an undergrad this past year, so I don't want to give everyone um, a false impression, but yeah, that was my experience. And it's been, I think, especially, um, I don't know, it just made a lot of sense during the pandemic that this is the work model that Open Golf has, you know, kind of employed and embodied um, just to do everything on our own time and check in on a weekly basis and see where we've come and then share ideas and then go apart again. Um, yeah, and I can add, um, I didn't start working with Open Golf until January, I think, so it's been even shorter, but I think the fact that it did happen right after the pandemic, I feel like we were introduced to a lot of like ways that we can collaborate online that we wouldn't have been aware of before. So for me, I didn't like formally meet um, Camille and that until like last week, most of like our interactions were just on Mattermost, which Nora mentioned earlier. But also it is kind of um, freeing because you do get to like work on your own pace when there's 
no like synchronous um, meeting times. So on one hand, it might be kind of a struggle, but also it does allow you to like get what you have to get done done by the time it needs to be done. And then whenever you meet, you just have it ready instead of having like expectations for every, I guess, hour of the day, what you're meant to be doing. So as I wait for um, some other hands, if other people have questions, I, oh, actually Adrian had a question. Oh yeah, I clapped and asked the question at the same time. Um, and I mean both. Um, <clears throat> thank you so much, that's so impressive. And I, I have to say it's very inspiring um, to see how fast this developed, right? You said you started three years ago now and it, it's so inspiring for you know those of us who have you know projects that um, are trying to do similar things and uh, and it's really great. I, I wanted to ask you just an open question that you know I was asked in the past, which is sort of the tension between being useful and providing an infrastructure for other researchers and also sort of providing already research questions, answering those research questions. I think here was very interesting in the um, presentation that you sort of did both already. Um, but how do you envision that process? How do you work with it through it? Um, another uh, question that I had was about um, the uh, uh, Camille and Nada's work on tribes in Iraq. Um, I'm a, I'm, I study cartography in the Ottoman Empire, uh, and so I know that this map, and I sort of, um, I've studied sort of the mapping commission that sort of produced these maps. And it seems to me, according to the archival documents, that no team really traveled to Iraq. So I was wondering, how would they get these polygons? How would they produce them? And, um, and what does that say about their own workflow in a way? If you think of Ottomans as mappers, uh, and if you sort of, yeah, think, think of yourself sort of reflexively as you know, studying map, map, you know, mappers themselves. Um, and so that was my other question. Uh, and also, you know, uh, tribes, not all of them, obviously, but you know, certain landscapes are also um, sort of fugitive or temporaries, certain villages are populated just during one season. So how do you envision um, mapping movement in general, which it seems for the Gulf might be an important aspect, unless I have, you know, unless, yeah, just thank you. <clears throat> why, don't let, why don't we let Camille and Nada answer the last part of the question and then we'll move yeah. Okay, okay, sounds good. Okay, thank you, Adrian. This is a really great question. And I can tell you right now that we don't have answers to all of that. So um, as for how the, inf I can say that according to the map itself, um, the information on how the, the, what it says about how it collected the information was that it was investigations conducted by the local government and the, the battalion commander, the Tabura Su, um, and some estimates based on local information. Um, so I will say that this map, I would love to know um, more about the mapping commissions that, that you've studied because this map, I found it during my dissertation research, not at the Bushbook, not at the Ottoman State Archives, but at the Istanbul University Resources Library. Um, and so there's not actually any other documentation included with it. Um, it's just the map itself and the table, um, which is both you know, interesting and, and somewhat frustrating. Um, I do think that there, you know, I found a couple other documents in the same part of the art this collection that are military in nature. And so the map is a sixth army, it's a, it's a map of the sixth army, which is the army that um, that operated in this in this region basically. Um, and so I, you know, I think that this is this is one of the things I was trying to gesture to when I was talking about certainty, is that I think that by putting by putting the the spaces on a map, both what the Ottomans doing and then what we're doing, is we're making this more certain than it is. I mean the map itself specifies that this is just the winter territories of the tribes in question. And so they're moving around. The assumption is that, that people are moving around. Um, and actually, if you zoom in, there are many polygons, in fact, where it just says multiple tribes or like mixed tribes, different tribes. And then some of them, there's like further details in the table. Oh, it's actually these eight tribes. And here's the population information for them. Um, but, some of, but some of them, it doesn't. And I think that that has, you know, it has interesting interesting implications for thinking about not just how the Ottomans understood the tri understood the tribe system, but also how people um, how different kinds of agricultural systems like impacted uh, 
in particular, I'm thinking the date agriculture system on the Shat al Arab. It's not a strong tribal system, at least it's not reported that way in the sources. And in fact, yes, you do get a bunch of polygons that are reported as being mixed. Um, and so, you know, anyway, but I think that the, the sort of broader questions about um, how to represent movement and, I, and how, to repre how to think about the intersection of this geography with other ways that the Ottomans are, are both administering geography, like through the administrative kind of structure of the Nahia, the Kaza and the Vilayet, and then also of just other kind of ways that geography is being represented is something that we're, we're still talking about. And I don't think it's something that will come from this map, but I think that that's one of you know, the, the potential promises of putting these different kinds of sources together and thinking through like a wide variety of, of sources at once. I don't know if anybody else has anything to, anything to add. So one of the things that I would add that, that actually Meta mentioned it in the, the, the discussion of the georeferencing process is that we turned from just working on uh, urbanization or settle, urban settlements uh, to thinking about some of the topographic features, particularly in the Iraq case with um, particular junctions and rivers or you know, another, another, uh, other, other than settlement uh, features on the map. But one of the things that we actually noticed on this particular map um, that we didn't mention in our presentation is that in the part which is actually the inset of Nejd, so the Arabian Peninsula, just below, <clears throat> there were actually a whole series of uh, essentially what were pathways that were written. And we didn't actually understand that um, to in, in the beginning. And those are not definitely not to scale. Um, but they do represent um, uh, uh, byways or throughways across uh, the Arabian Peninsula by means of wells. And so um, it took us a while to figure that out because as we were trying to use those features for georeferencing, everything was going wrong. <laughs> but we certainly have some indication that there, this, I know this is not about necessarily about tribal movement, but in terms of some forms of mobility or modes or means of uh, pathways um, that are possible um, for moving across such an arid um, landscape, that I think that those are possible. So what, I, what I'm getting at is that we may actually have in certain sources uh, decomposable layers uh, that can be taken out and reused in other contexts. And so I would very much like, sorry about the dog, um, the, 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 um, I would very much like to take those out, in other words, and to not even necessarily worry about georeferencing, but just extract that data from the map and to create other layers. And this kind of takes us, I think, to the question about a scholarly infrastructure for the group as opposed to the larger community. Right. I mean, I think one of the, the, the goals of this project is not to hold on to data for the purposes of making uh, just making images for articles I mean, certainly holding on to them for a certain amount of time until we're sure that they're high quality. But the idea is to release into the world to the whatever extent is possible. Um, the um, component data sets uh, that we have been creating over time. So what I see as scholarly infrastructure is not just team based infrastructure, but it's also about kind of a building of a digital golf studies or a building of a digital uh, spatial or spatial humanities uh, kind of work with texts and with spatial data of this general region, which could be of interest to the people who are working on Iran or people who are working on Turkey or the Mashrek, et cetera. So, thank you. Um, I can say a couple words if there are no other questions. Uh, thank you, Adrian. That's um, a great, question. I think that for me, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time and lost a lot of sleep over the past like decade about how the Ottomans conceptualize um, this question of tribe and, and how they're thinking about this category and also creating data about it. Um, it is quite similar, the kinds of data that they were creating in that table that to me, I mean, the spatialization for me is very unique. I haven't seen anything like that in the regions that I've worked on in Syria. But the data itself is, um, is it, it follows similar categories to other data that would be produced like by administrative council type entities, um, you know, across uh, this region. So like weapons, male and female population, sect. I mean, I think there is a way in which we can, we can think, I mean, I'm, not, I'm not trying to imply certainty. That's not a word that I really um, get into with, with questions of, of uh, state administration, but they're trying to 
you know, they're doing similar things to what they've done before, but the spatialization and how that was done and, you know, how those red lines were actually drawn, um, you know, I hadn't seen uh, that kind of a, that kind of a document before. And that was one of the reasons we, we got so excited about it. I'll just say too, I mean, it's been this, I think for, for David and I both, the research group kind of came out of us being located in the Gulf and both having sort of, in, you know, new research um, agendas that were related to the region we were living in. And it, it's not either of our field. And that's been, um, you know, sort of generative for thinking about a research group that collaboratively comes up with questions rather than this being a project focused around um, sort of the agenda and resources of one particular faculty member. Um, and so that's something that I, I, I think we kind of are trying to, to reproduce and stick with, but it does, you know, there are moments, the moment where we decided, which was relatively recently, to call this a research group and not a project was really sort of li like uh, liberating for me because I was like, okay, you know, what we're doing is actually getting materials out there. You know, the, the training, the pedagogy, all of it is kind of, is kind of part of the point. It's not only about um, outputs, you know, articles and, and, and books and the like. So I guess that's, that's one thing I would say about the research question output uh, tension, but it is one that we're sort of constantly living with. But thank you for those those questions, and we do have to come around, to come together around mapping commissions. <laughs> so, uh, I actually had a question uh, about the uh, the infrastructure and the process, and uh, because as it was laid out, it was almost like step by step. But I was wondering if you could speak more to almost a cyclical uh, nature, uh, especially as you create that infrastructure specifically the data that other scholars will be using and how you view yourselves in the position of returning to the data that you've produced or that others have produced to think critically and then uh, because with it just kind of being there that scholars are using uh, it kind of takes on a life of its own uh, if uh, without thinking critically about any data that we produce and so I was just wondering um, especially as it pertains to transcribus and 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 all of that uh, that data that you're producing. That is a great question. Uh, I really like that. I mean, I was very aware as I was making the on the development of the research group slide and choosing the template that was available to me in Google Sheets that I was not dealing with the linear process <laughs> and yet the availability <laughs> of, a, of what would fit on a slide um, sort of, you know, it, it, it pushed me in that direction of making it linear, definitely not linear process, a recursive and, and even iterative one, right, with a super interesting um, uh, cyclical quality to it. I can just give you a couple of examples. So when I said our first uh, sort of stage after uh, embedded exercises in the classroom or embedded experiments in the classroom was platform adoption. I think that we're constantly going under platform adoption and we're actually thinking about the kind of trying to imagine uh, as as slim and as functional right of platform adoption as possible. Um, uh, when we think about uh, transcription, certainly uh, Mo explained in his uh, section how just having transcription allowed for new languages which are not ocr right, in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a standard sense, or not even just available in a legacy corpora um, on the web, allowed for those texts to then go back into those original um, semantic annotation platforms. So certainly there's a, the process is one of, of, a, of a rich unfolding over time and a mixing of these different projects. I think the most, however, um, probably the most transformative has been just in general, the scattering and the virtualization of the group um, in terms of being thinking about um, projects um, and the, the the meeting of the minds around particular ones. I think if you think about the spatializing of Ottoman sovereignties, and the, that map, that's a really amazing um, <clears throat> example of where you have um, different people with different skill sets kind of running with. Now, the question for me is running with a, with an idea. And the question for me is when that when those polygons are published, um, what are they going to produce? Right in the world of um, Ottoman spatial humanities, or just say in Arabian spatial humanities, and I think that's—I mean—we really don't know what is coming, 
and yet I'm guessing that there will be um, that there will be uh, sort of uh, versioning of those data sets, right? That I'm sure that the communities that will be using the materials will be correcting those. One of the deliberate decisions that we made to um, put the Open Golf website as a GitHub static website is that it actually sits on top of a GitHub repository, which is theoretically anyone can push, uh, can down, can you know, can fork the data, correct it, and push it back. Right. So we're going to have to at some point think about a kind of the our policy on versioning or the way that we uh, think as a larger community. Um, about the different versions of the data that are coming forward. We're about to uh, embark this summer on a correction and enrichment of the data set of the annotation, all the geographic annotation of the Larmor data set. And I think that's a really, really big one. And I think that's a case where, in case in point as well, because we have so much uncertainty in there and so much, we have so many places that we don't know that we're expecting that a community of Gulf studies or just a, a community of people living in the Gulf you know, to poor to understand and uh, more about and to help us uh, in correcting. So, I can't tell you that the that that future of uh, of a community based open golf um, uh, 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 group of data sets is always going to be a um, um, it's always going to be a peaceful one, right? I'm sure there's going to be plenty of disagreement um, there, plenty of disagreement about the ontologies, about the categories that we've used, um, about the uh, the idea to turn to. Um, certain imperial kinds of documents, etc. But I'm pretty sure that it will be an active and interesting place for debate. And I'm hoping that the structure of the the, the project, the and the the embedded values in the project, will help manage the um, uh, the scholarly debates. Put that way. Thanks for the question.